following is a lecture on Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, text 17, recorded the 5th of September 1982, given by His Divine Grace Harikesha Swami Vishnupad at New Radakund, Sweden. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Shemad Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter 7, text 17. Tesham Gyani Nitya Yukta Eka Bhaktir Vishishyate Priyo Ki Gyanina Achatam Aham Sa Cha Mama Priya Tesham Gyani Nitya Yukta Tesham Gyani Nitya Mukta Yukta Eka Bhakti Vishishyate Eka Bhakti Vishishyate Kriyo hi gyani no chartam Kriyo hi gyani no chartam Aham sa cha mama priya Aham sa cha mama priya Te sham gyani nichi yukta Eka bhakti vishishite Kriyo hi gyani no chartam Aham Sachama Mapriya um, Out of them Gyani One in full knowledge Nitya Yukta Always engaged Eka Only one Bhakti Devotional service Vishishite Especially Priya Very dear he, certainly, Gyanina, person in knowledge, Achartam, highly, Aham, I am, Saha, he, Cha, also, Mama, mine, Priya, dear. Translation. Of these, the wise one who is in full knowledge, in union with me through pure devotional service is best. For I am very dear to him, and he is very dear to me. Purport. Free from all contaminations of material desires, the distressed, the inquisitive, the penniless, and the seeker after supreme knowledge can all become pure devotees. But out of them, he who is in knowledge of the absolute truth and free from all material desires, becomes a really pure devotee of the Lord. And of the four orders, the devotee who is in full knowledge and is at the same time engaged in devotional service is, the Lord says, the best. By searching after knowledge, one realizes that his self is different from his material body, and when further advanced, he comes to the knowledge of impersonal Brahman and Paramatma. When one is fully purified, he realizes that his constitutional position is to be the eternal servant of God. So by association with pure devotees, the inquisitive, the distressed, the seeker after material amelioration, and the man in knowledge all become themselves pure. But in the preparatory stage, the man who is in full knowledge of the Supreme Lord and is at the same time executing devotional service is very dear to the Lord. He who is situated in pure knowledge of the transcendence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is so protected in devotional service that material contaminations cannot touch him. Tesham gyani nitya yukta eka bhakti vishishite Pryo hi gyani no chartam Hamsacha mama priya Of these, the wise one who is in full knowledge in union with me through devotional service is the best. For I am very dear to him and he is dear to me. So last, yesterday I guess, <coughs> the last verse, this chatur vidya bhajante maam jnana sukriti narjuna arto jigyaso atarti jnani cha bhartar shabha 
Krishna is explaining there are four kinds of men who are interested in devotional service to Krishna. That is, the one who is in distress and who is interested in freedom from material conditions of life, the disturbing, distressed conditions of life, one who is uh, in need of some money, uh, he, he wishes to get material gain, one who is curious, and one who is searching for knowledge. Of these four kinds of persons, Krishna is now saying the one who is searching for knowledge is the best of all, of all these four. Because he very quickly comes to the platform of devotional service. Whereas the person who is looking for dis- to relieve his distress conditions or looking for money or looking for, he's just curious, he requires to spend some time in a prepar- preparatory stage, in this preparatory stage until he actually comes to the point of engaging in devotional service. He may approach Krishna. He approaches Krishna, prays to Krishna, begs Krishna for his mercy. That's all right. That's very nice. But until he actually comes to the platform of surrendering to Krishna and serving him in bhakti, that takes some time. But the jnani, or one who is actually interested in uh, understanding real knowledge, the jnani, he is more quickly coming to the platform of devotional service. Because Krishna says, Bhuhunam janmanam ante jnanavam ambrapajite. After many births and deaths, one who is actually in knowledge surrenders unto me. Gyanavan Mampapajite. So the one who is actually in knowledge, who is Gyanavan, who is a real possessor of knowledge, he surrenders to Krishna. So one of the qualifications is to develop your knowledge of Krishna. That's a very important qualification. Ultimately, of course, the point is with the knowledge to develop bhakti. That is what is stated here. Out of these persons, the jnani, he quicker develops the bhakti because he has knowledge of why he should, what the results will be or what the Vedic conclusion is like this. He would quicker develop bhakti. That is the, that is one of the uh, uh, benefits to having knowledge that it can nurture or develop bhakti or devotional service. Uh, there's jnana and vairagya. Jnana refers to the knowledge. Vairagya refers to renunciation. Both of these things are a servant of bhakti or devotional service. Vairagya vijjanija bhakti yoga. This is the showing shown by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that the performance of bhakti yoga automatically includes or automatically ne- develops or nurtures Knowledge and renunciation. Whereas in the Vedic presentation, sometimes they think, the brahmanas or whoever it is that is following the Vedic presentation, that jnana and vairagya are necessary elements or ingredients to developing bhakti. But actually, the bhakti is required in order to develop jnana and vairagya. In other words, to develop knowledge and renunciation one requires the devotional service. It is not that by devotional service one will... Uh, it is not that knowledge and renunciation one will develop devotional service. That's not necessarily true. There are many who in the past were engaged in the past path of knowledge, developing knowledge and becoming renounced. Many in the past, many yogis, uh, many great souls, sages, were very knowledgeable they could quote the whole Veda. Each person he would become knowledgeable in one part of Veda or two part of Veda or three part of Veda or all the Veda. Yeah. Therefore, sometimes they're called Trivedi, which means he knows the three Vedas. Or Chatur Vedi, he knows the four Vedas. He's a great soul. Of course, nowadays the name is there, but the qualification is not there. <laughs> so, that is knowledge, certainly. That is Gyan. That is certainly great knowledge. He knows. And then again, there may be a jnani who's also very renounced. It's not necessarily so that one who simply knows is also renounced. Because there are many 
uh, who are very knowledgeable, but then again, they may be very attached to mundane sense gratification or not very interested in leaving a comfortable life. So then comes the platform of renunciation. Those who actually have knowledge, they also are renounced. Of course, it is also true that some who are renounced have no knowledge, real knowledge. We find that in the in the example of the modern times. There are some who live very austerely in the Himalaya or in the Hardva Rishikesh. They live very austerely, but they have no knowledge. They cannot quote, they cannot understand what is actual philosophy or not. And some don't even care about philosophy. So it is possible you can be very renounced and have no knowledge. It's possible you can be very knowledgeable and not be at all renounced. And it's possible you can be renounced and full of knowledge and still not be devoted. There are some who are very knowledgeable of the Vedic prescriptions, Vedic rituals, Vedic understandings, and they are also very renounced and they're not interested in bhakti. They're not interested in serving Krishna. They come to the conclusion they want to be one with the Supreme, they want to merge with the effulgence of the Lord, or they want to become God. They also have no real uh, ability to come to the platform of devotional service because their knowledge and renunciation points them to another direction. So therefore, the real principle is when one is devoted to Krishna, then automatically Gyan and Vairagya or knowledge and renunciation develop. Vasudeva, Bhagavati, Bhakti Yoga, Prayojitaha, Janayati, Ashriyat, Vairagyam, Gyanam, Chayat, Ahaitikam. For one who is engaged in Vasudeva, Bhagavati, Bhakti Yoga, Prayojitaha, simply engaged in loving devotional service to Krishna. For him, automatically, knowledge and renunciation are developed within his heart. And Krishna says that also. For those who are engaged in loving devotion to Krishna, Satata all means always engaged. Bhajitam priti purvakam. With loving devotion, priti purvakam, that refers to very great love. The priti, just like Jugala priti in the song in the talk, actually refers to a, a nice love for Krishna actually have some love for Krishna. Uh, therefore, they're always engaged in devotional service. You know, if you don't have love for Krishna, you can't always be engaged in devotional service because you will act in a way to satisfy yourself. When one is interested in himself, that means he has love for himself. Therefore, the priti or love for Krishna is not actually developed. And because it is not actually developed, one will always be engaged in his own service. When he is not really a lover of Krishna, he loves himself, then he will serve himself. Serve himself with great love and devotion. Uh, and therefore, he cannot serve Krishna with love and devotion because he doesn't have time. You know, when you're always busy engaging yourself, you don't have time to serve Krishna. So, therefore, this satata principle is the first principle. First, he must always be engaged in devotional service. So these both are necessary points. Engagement in devotional service, that's nice. But being always engaged in devotional service denotes that you must have love for Krishna. This is called the bhava platform. One of the principles or points of one who's in bhava stage or actually has some love for Krishna, that is the point at which one develops love for Krishna, is that he doesn't want to waste a moment. He doesn't like to waste time. He can't stand wasting time. That is one of the principles of the bhava platform. He's always depending on Krishna and fully engaged in Krishna's service, so he doesn't have want to waste any time. So, therefore, he satata, always engaged. Otherwise, unless you are on the bhava platform, you can't be always engaged. Sometimes we find some come to Krishna consciousness and they engage a lot in devotional service, maybe even all the time. But then after time, they, they stop or they take it easy, or don't continue the service. So that is not satata yuktinam. Satata yuktinam means always. It doesn't mean always for a year. It means always. For many always years. Always, always years. 
It doesn't mean just one year, two years, three years, or four years and five months. It refers to specific, always, satata. That is the real platform of bhava, or actual love for Krishna. Then, Tesham Satatiya, Bhajatam Priti Purvakam, the Dhami. Then I give, Krishna says. That means you have to win the faith of Krishna, that you are actually serious. When Krishna says, I give, but he makes a qualifying statement to I give. He doesn't just give all the time. You know, after all, even in the Bhagavad Gita, it is stated that charity given to an improper person at the wrong time was charity in the mode of ignorance. So Krishna, he is not, of course, breaking his own rules like that. He will not just improperly give charity in the terms of this causeless knowledge and renunciation unless there is a qualification. And that qualification is, as before mentioned, you must be always engaged in his service. Then Krishna knows you're his man. Then you are meant for him. We are Krishna's men. So when he knows that, when you've won the faith of Krishna, that he believes you're always with him, then, dadami buddhi yogam tam, jena mamupayantite. I give them that full knowledge by which they, I just, Krishna says, I destroy the ignorance. Tesham evan, tesham evanu kampartam, aham agyanatam tama, ashayami atma bhavashto, gyanati pena bhashvita. I destroy all the darkness of ignorance with the shining lamp of knowledge. So destroy, that doesn't mean you become enlivened in Krishna consciousness from for a day or during the kirtan. It means destroyed. Uttama. You're, this now has to refer to the uttama. Tama means darkness. Ut means above. Above all darkness. Therefore, he's the topmost man. Therefore, when you say Uttama Adhika, refer to the topmost man. Because he's above ignorance. And how do you get above ignorance? Nashayami Atma Bhava Shto Gyana Dipena Bhashita. When Krishna destroys it with the shining lamp of knowledge. To who? To he who's always engaged in loving devotional service to the Lord. Satata. Always. So, this platform is not a very simplistic platform. And it's not something cheap. It is not just because you are enlivened in devotional service for a while that you come to the Uttama platform. Because the Tama is there until it is fully wiped out by Krishna. How many times we've seen the stories Dhruva Maharaja would have wanted to offer prayers then touched by the hand of Nishingadev Prahlad Maharaj or touched by the conch shell of Vishnu, Dhruva Maharaj and then all the darkness of ignorance washed away completely and purified, fully purified. So, this platform requires full constant engagement in devotional service. And to come to that platform means one has to know fully well, initially, that to waste one's time means one is not actually going to be attaining the trust, full, absolute faith of Krishna, that here I am actually interested in serving Him. To waste one's time at all to think it is my time or my facility or my money or whatever. So, the requirement is that one has a full knowledge of what is actually pleasing to Krishna and what is actually wrong in what I'm doing. And then, to always be engaged in Krishna's service, then the love comes. This is what it means, in Artha Nivriti. Anartha means the unwanted things. Anartha Nivriti Shat. Then comes after that, Nishta, when one actually has freed himself from all the material contaminations, meaning these material unwanted ignorances, tama, and even rajas, you free yourself from all of the passionate activity or passionate understanding as well. Then one comes to the pure goodness platform. When he comes at least to the majority of goodness platform, because no living entity can be purely in goodness without being a pure devotee, at that point is the bhajana, is the uh, anartha nirviti. The unwanted things, which means all of these unwanted habits, they are just dropped off. Unwanted contaminations are dropped off. Then one gets a firm faith. When one has that firm faith, 
then he's firmly fixed in devotional service. That's the satata platform. Then he gets that full knowledge. And that automatically brings with it the dawning of the taste, the ruchi. Ruchi means some taste. One gets a taste in devotional service. It is not that this taste in devotional service comes uh, before one is purified fully. You get, you can get some taste, but you don't have the real taste. Just like there are connoisseurs, people who are very much into the taste of something, really appreciate it, and those who just like it. You know, they go to some restaurant and they eat, and they say, okay, it's good. It's better than what my wife makes. And then there are those who go and they relish and then they roll it on the tongue and all this nonsense. So anyway, this is called the connoisseur. Anyway, so that is the difference. There are, you can have some taste, certainly. You can have some taste in devotional service. But yes, you like it. You like the devotional service. You like Krishna. You like this. You have some taste. And that taste causes you to want to take it more. But until you get to the platform of being a real... You have that delicate taste, that ruchi, that real. You begin to really to understand what it is all about. Then that taste is very, how to say, refined. And then gradually that refined taste becomes more refined. Then one comes to the bhava platform where the dawning of love is there, the real. And then the real love for Krishna. That also means that the realization of one's spiritual form is coming. Because the form is developing. You know, it's in a seed-like state. One has a potential to have a certain relationship with Krishna. But it is not like that potential is yet realized. The potential is there, but it is not yet realized. We have to, it's like a seed. It has to be watered, nurtured, and gradually the spiritual form will develop. It's not like it's already there. It's potentially there. Just like a tree is potentially there in the seed. And when the seed is planted, then it grows. So similarly, the form has to be developed. And when the form is beginning to be developed, we can begin to see it's like this. So then we begin to understand, yes, uh, the love of Krishna is like this a little bit. We get a little bit to see as the dawning of that platform. And when the spiritual form is fully developed and one has his relationship with Krishna firmly established because the form means relationship automatically that is prema the topmost platform where one is firmly situated in his loving relationship with the Supreme Lord that is absolute fixed and an immovable thing so it takes a long time to develop like this to the one higher taste it's not like higher taste is just something you get in the kirtan once and that's it. That is a taste. That is certainly a higher taste than the nescience one is generally in. But that is not the higher taste which is referred to when we speak about the actual higher taste. The actual higher taste comes when one is firmly situated in his loving service to Krishna, direct service. Now, until one gets to that platform, he can certainly have a higher taste, but not the highest taste. The higher taste you can get when you are just simply on the platform of doing things for Krishna. Otherwise, one may mistake his material feeling or his coming to the mode of goodness, which is higher, as being the higher taste. And then when it goes away, he'll think, what is this higher taste? It went away again. But that's just a higher taste, certainly. Higher meaning, in English we're stuck here with these words. That is certainly a higher taste, but that's not the higher taste. <laughs> it is something better than ignorance, that is for sure. <laughs> so we have to keep pushing, you know, to get ourselves to the highest taste. Yeah. That is why Krishna is explaining here, one who is in full knowledge of me, you know, knowledge is not depending on the higher taste. Don't forget. Knowledge is not depending on this higher quality of the person. Because, after all, we explained, there are those who have knowledge, but don't have Krishna. You can have knowledge, but you should have knowledge of Krishna, the person Krishna. 
not just knowledge of Brahman and Vedantic philosophy, this and that. should have knowledge of Krishna. And then one will be able to firmly situate himself in devotional service. And that person, he's the best. So don't be just a foolish person engaged in devotional service. But one should be a person who is knowledge of Krishna and engaged in devotional service. One has to wake up, uh, wake up to the reality of his situation that he is presently in. One has to know himself to a certain degree. He has to understand what he knows, what he doesn't know. One cannot just be sentimental. One has to actually know. That, do I actually know Krishna? You have to question yourself. Do I actually know Krishna? Do I actually know devotional service? Do I know what surrender is? Do I know what it means to serve Krishna? Or am I simply interested in a nice situation for myself? That's the point. Do I actually know what it means to surrender to Krishna? This is a very difficult thing to know how far one can push himself or how far one has to push himself to get himself to actually serve Krishna. You know, the mind just clicks off sometimes. We don't really pay attention to what we are doing or we do it whimsically or quickly or without any attention. Devotion means you're devoted to your activity of service. You're really careful to do it properly. You're very eager to do it very, very nicely, perfectly in all respects. That's the meaning of the word devotion. It doesn't mean we just do things just to get them done or... You know, we never think like that. If somebody tells us to please do this service, little service, we don't think about doing it properly. We just get it done quick so we can do what we want to do. But no, even that little service is a way to please Krishna if you do it very nicely. But the mundane idea is always there. This is not important, that's not important, that's not important. But whatever service we've been given, that is important. It's the absolute platform we're talking about now. Whatever service you've been given, that is important. And you should do it very nicely. That's knowledge. You do whatever service you're supposed to be doing nicely. That's knowledge. And whatever other service there is, you avoid because it is not your service. Krishna says you should perform your duty. You don't have to worry about other things. You do what you're supposed to do nicely. And then you do it with great devotion. You concentrate on it. And then gradually you increase that or expand that service or perform more services. This way your devotion develops. And then you come to the platform, you can do anything nicely. Whatever it is you're supposed to do, you do it nicely. Prabhupada once said, the devotee is like a cow. Wherever you put him, he makes milk. You put the cow here, there, anywhere, the same thing. Cow eats grass and makes milk. But if you, we are thinking with a mundane idea, then we are very choosy and picky about what we're going to do and when we're going to do it and what I want to do, what I don't want to do. Again, the mind is there. Sankalpa, vikalpa. I will accept this and I will reject this. And if you ask why, it is simply the platform of sense, senses, what my senses like, what my senses don't like. So this, with this understanding, we can never come to the platform of pretty or love. We can never be constantly engaged. Because then we'll always find reasons uh, not to be engaged. When we don't have that real loving devotion to Krishna, uh, then we'll always have devotion for ourselves and find other things to do, other reasons to do it, this and that. So this is not very good. Therefore, knowledge is required. Don't think you can just be a devotee without knowledge. You must have some knowledge. But then you must also be engaged. You see, just simply getting knowledge, that's not enough. There are plenty of people also who have great knowledge. But they don't really have Krishna. Because getting Krishna means you serve Krishna. This point has to be emphasized again and again because we forget. Otherwise, why do we have so many problems getting people to serve Krishna when they have to do a certain this and that? Why? Because they don't know that serving Krishna is bhakti yoga. It's such a simple point. And if, if I were to say this without emphasizing the problem, if I just said this in a class, nobody would listen. Serving Krishna, this is bhakti yoga. If I said that in a class, everybody would think, what a simplistic statement. Of course.
course, I have to, I have to have, obviously. And no one would listen. Their minds would go blank. They'd have the eyes up there. Devotees are expert at having the eyes fixed, but the mind blank. <laughs> and the, look, but nothing's there, you know, they just, yeah, I heard that, I heard that, yeah, I heard that, yeah, I heard that. Oh, I didn't hear that. What was that? Can you repeat that, please? Oh, yeah, I heard that, I heard that, I heard that. But it's not true. One may have heard so many times, serving Krishna is bhakti yoga. But when it comes time to serve Krishna, oh, I've got to do this and that, i got to wash my clothes, i got to cut my toenails, i got to do this and that. <laughs> but serving Krishna is bhakti yoga. If one wants to call himself a devotee, that he's actually performing service to Krishna, he's supposed to be a devotee, you know, he's a bhakti yogi, that means he must be serving Krishna. But if we examine how much actual service there is to Krishna, we'll find it's very little. Maybe somebody can manage to get himself to sit down through the morning program and eat prasadam. Of course, everybody manages to do that. But then after that, if you time the actual amount of devotional service in a day, you'll see it's so little in some persons because they don't know that serving Krishna is bhakti yoga. That by serving Krishna, they're going to make spiritual advancement and they're going to become purified. They think, no, I will wait till I serve Krishna in that way. Until that time, I won't waste my time. Now, what are they doing in the meantime? It's not wasting their time. Either you're serving Krishna or you're wasting your time. There's only two platforms. Serving Krishna or wasting time. So then, how somebody can make a statement, I'll only serve Krishna in that way, I don't want to waste my time with other activities. This is complete maya. One has to actually serve Krishna all the time. That's what it means to be a devotee. If you're not serving Krishna, you're not a devotee. Such a simple point. So maybe we should not call ourselves devotees so much. We should call ourselves half devotees or three-quarter devotees. We have to make a proportion chart, you know, how much we serve ourselves and how much we serve Krishna. And when we are always serving Krishna, then we can call ourselves devotees. So how many devotees do we have? Prabhupada. <laughs> In this way, we see what rascals we all are. Amazing. And we call ourselves devotees. And we have to examine, you see. Being a devotee means you have to be a little honest with yourself. You're supposed to be verminical. To be Brahminical means you have to be a little honest with yourself. You have to understand what you are. And somebody who thinks, I'm a great devotee, he won't question the fact that he's wasting six hours out of the day. During the middle, you know, just take ten minutes here and a half hour there and a 45 minutes there and an hour there. He won't question that fact because, after all, he's a great devotee. Why should he question the fact that he's in Maya? I mean, obviously he's not in Maya. But if you go up to that same person and you say, my dear sir, what are you doing now to serve Krishna? He'll go, oh yes, yeah, I'm just about to do this and then. I have so many excuses. They say, well, you're not, you're not serving Krishna. What do you mean I'm not serving Krishna? See, you have to be a little honest to judge what you're doing. Are you just wandering around the creation? Going here, going there. Sometimes devotees manage to figure out how to waste their time just going places. <laughs> They always go places. They have nothing to do in these places. Now maybe they have something to do in the place, a little bit. They just make excuses. Well, I have something to do here. And they go. Because they, they don't serve Krishna. But they have to do something to keep active. So they just go somewhere. Or they go somewhere else. Or they go here or go there. Creating, it's called busy work in English. Busy work. It means you have nothing to do. You just make something up to do just to keep your hands busy. Just like sometimes in class, just to keep awake. People do this and that or the other thing, you know. <laughs> so they stay away. It's called busy work. This is not this is not what a devotee does. See, he is very much eager to always do something for Krishna. And when, when you don't waste time, you can accomplish so much. And when you waste time, then you can't accomplish anything. Because time sucks away all your energy and all of your inspiration and all of your life. Therefore, to actually make spiritual advancement, one has to, first of all, understand he shouldn't waste time. One shouldn't waste time. 
and he should always be eager to serve Krishna. No. We don't know how to say this so many times again and again. We have to say this a minimum a thousand times a day. We have to serve Krishna. What am I doing? Oh, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. I have to serve Krishna. If we have this fixed in our heads, we'll actually make spiritual advancement. Satata yuktana. Then Krishna will give us the intelligence. Until then, no intelligence. We'll, we will not be able to manifest intelligence. Maybe. Some mundane intelligence will be able to speak about or demonstrate. Uh, but when it comes time to doing something for Krishna, it won't happen. I have seen many examples of big, mundanely speaking, intelligent people. Uh, they can talk to you about all kinds of things and demonstrate great intellect. But when it comes time to serving Krishna, they fall flat on their faces. They can talk big, but they can't do anything. Talk is cheap. To display your great qualities and characteristics simply by talking, that's a very cheap thing. But to actually do for Krishna, that is very valuable. Very valuable. So therefore, the platform of action is superior to the platform of simple talk when it comes to your great qualities. Lesser men talk, greater men do. Lesser men talk about their great achievements and greater men just make great achievements. Because the lesser men, they're always so busy talking, they're satisfied by that talking. They're satisfied by talking about themselves that they are so wonderful. That satisfies them. That's sufficient for them because they have no depth of character. But for a great man, he's not satisfied by that. He's satisfied by actual accomplishments for Krishna. So therefore, uh, one who really wants to be known as a devotee must do devotional service. And not simply that he shall determine him what devotional service he will do all the time. One has to actually get a duty. Isn't this whole Bhagavad Gita about duty? Actually, when it comes right down to it, what is this book all about? Arjuna's duty surrendering to Krishna. That's what the whole Bhagavad Gita is all about. Arjuna said, I don't want to do my duty. And Krishna said, you must. Because this is what I'm asking you to do. So ultimately, the whole book is just about that. Why Arjuna should do his duty. And where did he get it from? He got it from Krishna. So in a similar way, we get our directions from Krishna through the Parampara system. And we must perform our service that way. Not according to our own speculations, like Arjuna wanted to speculate himself a service. He was going to take the service of uh, sitting under a tree. That is not his duty. His duty is to actually serve Krishna, as Krishna wanted. So therefore one must get his service and perform it. That is devotional service. Get your service through the proper system and do it. And as long as you're doing that, you'll be happy. And as soon as anything else is there, either you don't do your service or you don't get it from proper authorities, then misery is there. And as soon as you surrender to your service and do it without the mental platform telling you, no, I will accept this, I will not accept that, as long as you are surrendering to the mental platform, there will be miserable conditions. All of them. And as soon as one actually surrenders to his service, immediately the material nature just lifts its heavy veil. So this is the basic principle upon which devotees make advancement. And as long as we don't understand this principle, we will not make advancement. We will always remain in the neophyte platform. And when we understand this principle, then we will make advancement of life. Make advancement in spiritual life. So, we must learn this principle. <laughs> it must be heard over and over again. And then, one will become very dear to Krishna. One who is always devoted to me, a steadily devoted soul, gains, attains unadulterated peace, always thinking of Krishna, all doing everything for Krishna. So many times he says it in here. Krishna is saying, you just turn the direction of your consciousness and activities towards me, and act as you are obligated or as you are requested under the direction of the spiritual, then you will 
gain the love of Krishna. Krishna will have that reciprocating relationship with you. You will be very dear to Krishna, and Krishna will be very dear to you. What does it mean to be dear to Krishna? That's no ordinary platform. When you are dear to Krishna, then Krishna will take very good care of you. When Krishna is dear to you, you become dear to Krishna. You can't just make Krishna artificially dear to you. There must be actual realization there. Actual realization must be there, as we have just described. Then, Krishna will be very dear to you, and you will automatically be very dear to Krishna. And then he will take care of you. He will carry what you lack, preserve what you have. He will give you all opportunities for surrendering unto him. Whatever great obstacles there are before you, he will give you the intelligence to conquer over them. He will also take away these obstacles when they are too great. Krishna will somehow or another help you to surrender to him if you are sincere to do so. So we must be sincere. Don't ask how do we become sincere. That is something you can do. By being sincere, you become sincere. By getting off the sentimental, mental platform, which is simply some idea of some feeling, emotion you have, this or that. Getting off the mental platform of acceptance and rejection. Getting off the platform of gross bodily attachments. And getting on the platform of serving Krishna. That is the way it is done. Serve Krishna nicely by chanting nicely, hearing nicely, surrendering nicely to Krishna. That's very important. Are there any questions? Yes. Krishna said it. Let's give credit where credit is due. You can get intelligence in your service from Krishna. All intelligence comes from Krishna. It's not exactly what is being talked about here. You can get, certainly, there are two ste- There are two ways you can understand this particular verse. I took it in the higher sense. It's not like it's a higher or lower sense. I took it in another sense. In the sense of always being engaged. But well, who is always engaged? So I took it in that sense. But you also get intelligence from Krishna when you are engaged. Although you may not be always engaged, you get some intelligence from Krishna. But it is nowhere near the amount of intelligence to come to Krishna as you will get when you are fully engaged. Then Krishna will personally direct you. There's a difference there. One is help. Krishna is helping even the demon to be a demon. Krishna helps everybody. And for you, the devotee, who's trying to come to that platform of always being engaged, he will help you too. But when you're really fully engaged in that way, Krishna will personally direct you. Sadami Buddha Yogam Tam Jaina Mamu Bhyantate, I actually give it. Sadami, that's just the way that's the I give that particular usage. And then at that time Krishna guides you just like you go there, do this now. Go there, go there, go. You see? Direct guidance. Krishna by me. Yes, he forced you to surrender by drowning you in the ocean of love of Godhead and then you love Krishna. There's two ways you can make one swim. He can walk in himself gradually or he can take him and throw him in and dunk his head under the water. So Krishna is demanding the walk-in process. And Lord Chaitanya skipped that process. He just took the living entities and poured the water on them. They didn't want to go in the water. So then he took the water and poured it on them and thus drowned them. The, the flood just overflowed everywhere. And then everything was flooded completely over the head. Therefore, everybody was in, was totally floating in the love ocean of love of God. 
But that's what Lord Chaitanya did. Now, unfortunately, he's not personally here doing that anymore. So somehow or another, we have to dig up that ocean. From the, it has to swell up again. Start just pouring everywhere. It's already coming, gradually, but we have to you know, dig the canals and the irrigation ditches so it gets here to Sweden. <laughs> it's a long way to flow. Yes? But the spirit that doesn't mean that you stop getting instruction from the spiritual master. What is the difference? You'll get instruction both ways too. You can also get direct instruction from Krishna. But then you can also get instruction from the spiritual master. And what if the spiritual master is not there anymore on the planet? Yeah, one has to actually be engaged in the service. If one is not absorbed in it, then he's absorbed in something else, isn't he? That means he's also engaged in something else. The degree is engaged in something else, he's not performing his service master. Mind fixed. Yeah. yeah, but once it's once it's made, it's there. You don't conquer it again by the mind. Even you've made your sickness by your mind, now you're sick. You can't conquer it just by the mind. The sickness can create anxiety, uncleanliness. These things can create disease. But once you've got the disease, it's not like when you if you just become free from anxiety and get clean and your disease goes away. You've already got the disease, now you have to do something about it. No, you can just go on serving Krishna and when you collapse you go and lay down. And if you're too sick to go on doing it, then you have to. Then you shouldn't work yourself to the collapsed state. It requires a little brain, you know. I'm not going to give class tomorrow morning. Well, thank you for me to just zoom off. If I give class, then you'll stay. I'm purposely not going to give class. You just can't around and zoom out. Thus, you can understand the real purpose. You gonna come back next weekend too? What? Passionate? No, just not passionate and understanding, just the mode of passion. I mean, I was trying to say it in the sentence passion and business. It actually means just come above the mode of passion. <laughs> of course you can hope. You must hope. Hope springs eternal. That's the saying, you know? You can always hope that Krishna will put some intelligence in those six goals. Why not? In one sense, it's good that there's no intelligence in there. Then, then all possibility for Krishna to put it in. <laughs> if you came with all kinds of mundane intelligence, then there's no room for Krishna to stuff spiritual intelligence in. trying to encourage <laughs> just like when somebody's completely down completely finished you say listen look on the bright side of things you can't get any worse <laughs> the only way to go is up <laughs> yes. No, no, after the whole lifetime of doing These are going on by water. Lord Shiva destroys by fire. All the fire comes out of all the rudras, eleven rudra forms. They start dancing wildly and fire comes out everywhere and everything is burnt through everything. Burnt finish finished inside. Then it all merges in the body of Mahavishnu. Huh? No, also very hot fire comes from him too. It's just hot then, you know. The universe requires a lot of heat. Burn it up. No, but he he first got it when he was very they were small, Vidarasha took over. So then he got a taste of what it was like. And then when they grew up, he gave them the kingdom. 
And then they became very opulent. Everybody loved them everywhere. But then they had this gambling mess. Then they lost the kingdom. Then they went into the forest. Then they came back. Then the battle took place. Well, it was like I just said. Why should we hear what it, you think it was? No, you never read anything different than that. No. It's not explained anywhere very clearly. This happened, that happened, that happened, that happened, that happened, that happened. It takes a while to figure it out. You know, if you just read the Mahabharata, then you figure it out very quickly. But it's, this is the way it happened. First, there was the kingdom. It was taken by Jitarashtra because the boys were too young when they grew up. Then the kingdom was given back, but he didn't like that because his sons got a taste also for the royalty. Then, after that, the, the Yudhisthira became very opulent. Then he performed the Rajasuya sacrifice, and then the gambling match took place. You can also read the why Dhritarashtra, no, why Duryodhana felt insulted, the chapter in the Krishna book. They had such an opulent place. Yeah? There in the first place. Because they're all different grades of men, all different classes of men. And they have to be given an opportunity to surrender to Krishna. And that's the only way they can do it. It's the way they can serve Krishna. And they can also get the benefit of going to the heavenly planet. At least they get something. They don't degrade into the animal species. Krishna is also merciful. He also gives you a chance, a way that you can at least get yourself to the heavenly planet. At least you can't do anything else. You can enjoy for a little while up there. All opportunities are there. If the opportunity wasn't there, then what is this? That means Krishna is only helping you to go to hell. That's not very nice. He also helps you to go to heaven. Heavenly planet. But as far from the devotional point of view, it's all worthless whether you go to heavenly planet or hellish planet. The devotee doesn't really make a distinction. Both worthless. He wants to go to the spiritual world. Therefore, Vyasadeva, when he was inspired by Narada, was inspired by that association to present the real thing, which is to go back home, back to Godhead. Therefore, he rejected all these other things as worthless, because these goals are worthless. But in the material relative sense, they're worth more than going to the hellish region. <coughs> huh? Somewhat purification, but that's not the real purification that brings you back on the right, like you've gone. You can go up and down in the heavenly planets and up and down like all the time and not be a pure devotee ever. So what is the use of purification if it doesn't get you back to God? So therefore, we don't really talk about it as a purifying process. It may be purifying, sure, but purifying of the lower modes of nature, getting you to some more higher mode of nature. But what is the use of that purification if it does not bring about love of God? Going back home, back to God. It means that you cannot, by talking establish the form of the Supreme Personality of God in, in all of His glory. It's already there. So the Vedic description, the Vedic words and mantras are a description of what's already there. And to a certain degree you can understand it through the description. <coughs> no. Only in the human form. <coughs> There's a verse that into that in the seventh canto, third part. So it's hard to find verses talking about that. It's such an elementary point. Bhagavatam is not for the elementary point. So there's in the seventh reader, there's many verses in there. By that great sage who was lying in the python condition. But everybody, until the flat point of getting rid of the material body, has some impurities. The body itself has some impurities. Unless one is in the spiritual form. When we speak about the Goswamis of Vrindavan, we talk about Shri Prabhupada, we talk about those who didn't have that contamination of the material body, because the body was already spiritualized. That's why we don't burn the body, we just put it in Samadhi. It was already spiritualized, fully, completely, totally.
there are many levels of the total spiritualization or just becoming gradually developing more developed totally developed just the subtle thing how it develops in other words how much one has realized his spiritual condition and how much the body is then because of the touch of the spiritual body the material body becomes completely absorbed in the spiritual energy how can you tell the difference you can't therefore what's the use of even talking about it you can't tell you can only hear about it those who already are also already that advanced they can also see the condition they can see whose body is in which condition those who are not they'll never be able to see because it looks the same you know same five fingers fingernails knuckles looks the same but those who actually have eyes see that it doesn't look the same just like they say about us all you Hare Krishnas look the same shaved head throaty look all the same but I mean it's ridiculous everybody doesn't look the same everybody looks different but it's because they don't have the eyes developed to see what is the difference between one body that is spiritualized I just said because the contact of the spiritual body is there what makes something spiritualized might be the next question and the answer is that that which is used in Krishna's service is spiritual and it becomes spiritualized because it's used in Krishna's service but that obviously does not mean it becomes eternal because that, it's still made of material elements material elements decay but while it is existing it is spiritual Because there's no ignorance to it anymore. It's engaged in its rightful claim in Krishna's service. More rational explanation. I, wait a minute, wait a minute. Extra service? Then you can't do your own service? This sounds very confusing to me. Then that means if there's some other time which you're wasting generally everybody wastes some other time then one has to do that other thing but if it's not possible there is no time you're wasting well then you have to explain to the person well then you can't do this other thing for that much time because there's no extra time but you'd have to have a pretty strong case to convince whoever it was that asked you to do it that you are not wasting time because nobody ever believes you don't waste time I mean, not you in particular, everybody. Because everybody knows everybody wastes time. Therefore, your your plea may be going on deaf ears. And then maybe you're going to have to actually surrender and stop wasting time and do the other service. But if you're actually not wasting any time, very good, then you can rightfully say, well, listen, I have no time. So that means I do the other thing less. Is that okay? Yeah. Now this service is more important. You please do that and later on you can go back. Then, then that's another thing. But you have to present your case like that. I'm actually not wasting any time. I actually don't have time. I'm actually always engaged in service. That's another thing. Aha! So here we come to the question. Make work their way around the bush, you know. <laughs> It's very good to read, very good, very important. So, uh, one should try to do his other services quicker. So then he does have some time to read. Yeah? But generally in every day there's always some time. What can I say? You know, serve less, read more. As soon as I say that, then the whole Pandora's box is open. And now come all these little things. That, uh, uh, uh. Yeah. 
The material nature does not create desire. The desire comes from you. But in the stimulus that the material nature offers you, your desire to enjoy branches off in other directions. It's like a, you may not have any desire to eat right now. You have any desire to eat right now? No. But let us say somebody walks in here with a really good tasting something rather that smells very nice. And that smell goes in your nose and all of a sudden you desire to eat. You didn't desire to eat. But all of a sudden you desire to eat. How is that? Because of the stimulus. And how does the stimulus create within you the desire to eat? Because you have an overall desire to enjoy. That's your desire. And it just manifests in different ways according to the stimulus that's presented to you. By material nature. That means you listen. Even even you don't understand, you listen. Because the, the words, if they're coming from a pure devotee, will purify you. Even if they're not coming from a pure devotee, if they are the words of the pure devotee, they will purify you. And if, in other words, if he's repeating, exactly. That is purifying not so much so as that which is coming from one who realizes. But still, still can. Very much. No, not in his On the level of, that means we worship Radha Krishna on the level of Lakshmi, with opulence. We're not worshiping Lakshmi Narayan. We're worshipping the Radha and Krishna on the level of Lakshmi because we can't worship Radha Krishna on the level of Radha Krishna because that worship is done in Vrindavan by pure devotees. Huh? You may not understand, but at least you remember it. And then, and then later on, one day something happens that causes that remembrance to spark into a realization. Or you may get some realization and not really know exactly how it fits in. And then you read and then you, you see something which say, aha, just see, yeah, I have that experience. And then you get deeper realization because the knowledge is there. And obviously you can't get everything. You get some. But if you didn't read, you didn't get anything. And the more you read, the more you get, gradually. Then read them again. No, maybe the consciousness is so dull it never got in there in the first place to be recalled. You have to purify. Purification is required. How Krishna can simultaneously be the most renounced and the greatest supreme enjoyer. Because right in the middle of the night, when Krishna was dancing with hundreds of gopis who were ready to do anything that Krishna wanted, he left them like that and went away. And they were all going mad, insane, crying and screaming, and acting completely wildly insane. But he didn't come back. And they started running like an army through the woods, trying to find Krishna everywhere. Where is Krishna? Where is Krishna? He was just lost. And then finally, when they were lamenting enough that all their pride was gone, that they had so much pride they were with Krishna, then Krishna came back. Nobody else does that. Therefore, he's the most renowned. She wears her pride like a decoration. How we don't understand. You could become a pure devotee, then you can understand. How we don't understand. (laughs) That's a good one. So? Position, etiquette, this is the etiquette. 
One has to act according to the etiquette. You should not break the etiquette. It just causes a disturbance. Even if you don't like somebody, if he has a higher position, you just, just be quiet about it. Treat him respectfully. Otherwise, it just makes disturbance. How they exactly do it, nobody can say. Cat and dog or whatever they are. That's the unfortunate position of the people who are. Very serious business. This is the way it's set up. If you want a rational analysis of, you know, the crime and the punishment and the mess. And then, you know, when you find out that it's not exactly a rational punishment, then you have to, then you want to change it, you know. But the court system isn't like that down there. And I don't think you learn very much. I think you just get punished. not that every punishment is simply to teach you something. Because most thieves or whatever never learn. Materialists are impossible to not understand why they should be punished if they don't learn. Then their, their idea is, but you don't learn by punishment, so why punish? But why you don't learn? Because you're a rascal. Does that mean you should stop being punished? I'm a rascal because I'll, I'll never learn. You know. So you should stop punishing me. This is very good logic. He refuses to learn. But then you have to keep punishing him until he, until he gives up this desire that he's never going to learn. He can learn. But because he's a rascal, he refuses. So it's not very good logic to say stop punishing him just because he refuses to learn. It doesn't say that a devotee doesn't care if he goes to heaven or hell. It says if he's in heaven or in hell, it's the same to him. It's not like he, you know, wouldn't care if he went to hell. Or even if he went to heaven. I mean, he'd probably rather not go to those places if he had his own choice. But if he was there, it wouldn't matter to him because he would still be engaged in the same service. He would be engaged in service to Krishna. He doesn't go to those places, no. He doesn't go to hell places. So, in other words, it just describes his quality. Even if he went there, he'd still be engaged in service. He might not like the place, but he'd still be engaged in service. Because to him, any place he doesn't like, if there's no facility to serve Krishna. For, for one who's actually on the spiritual platform, for him it really doesn't matter, even if he did go to hell. Because he doesn't experience that. He sees everything as Krishna's energy. That's the, that's the platform, you know, Uttama. He doesn't have any contact with the material world anymore. Those devotees you don't find. You can't find such an Uttama personality because to preach, for you to meet him, he has to be a preacher. And therefore, he has to come down to the Majjhimani Karasatva. So he doesn't have that vision because he has to stay on that platform. Ah, Ramananda Roy, etc. Yeah. I mean, but he didn't get killed, did he? I mean, you know, now you're bringing in a, a weird slant, you know. Lajitanya was teaching everybody. He also refused to see the king, Prada Paruja, who was also perfectly pure devotee, because of the etiquette. He was maintaining externally etiquette. Don't bring in, you know, he was this and that former Krishna leader and why they decided to do this and that. And you're starting to question motivation. That's just weird, you know. When you start to question the motive of Lord Chaitanya, that's weird. You know, do you understand that's weird? Yeah, but if you want to understand the situation, you don't have to understand the motive of Lord Chaitanya. 
like that, the way you were doing it. You can understand that he was ex keeping up the etiquette. Whatever great man does, everybody follows. So if Lord Chaitanya led this person off very freely, then everybody would follow his example, which is not a very good example. Because he was breaking the injunction. Therefore he let him sweat. And everybody saw that he was sweating. And they saw they had to really pound Lord Chaitanya to give the mercy to Pundarik Vijanini. So finally he did it at the end. But then everybody understood, we better not do the same thing. Yeah, but why do you get satisfaction? Because you are engaged in this highest service. Nobody, no, nobody can think like that just because they can feel good. And it's ridiculous. You don't think like that. It doesn't matter. You just you just do it and you're blissful. And you know why you're doing it. You may not every minute be aware of it because it becomes part of your life. It's your life. So why should you always be thinking, no, no I am saving the pawns and this and so on. I mean, you're doing it. It's a natural part of your life. Just like when you're walking down the street, you don't think, now I'm walking down the street. Well, then you have to remind yourself now and then. You know, it's very hard to you know, start talking about what you think. That, you know, you have to listen and develop. Then remember more. If you have a danger of forgetting, then you should remember more. Isn't it? So what are you going to tell yourself? You know? Do you have to? Aha! Then you'll do better. If you're already remembering, you don't have to remind yourself. It's not like you have to have these words running through your head. I'm doing this for this reason. It's not like if you're not thinking that, that you're not doing it for that reason. And it's not like if you're doing it for another reason, if you have those words going in your head, I'm doing it for this reason, that it makes it that way. Let's say you want to enjoy sense gratification of eating an ice cream cone somewhere, and you say, I'm doing this for Krishna. That doesn't make it that way. <laughs> Just simply having the words in your head. And neither when you're distributing books do you have to have the words in my head, I'm doing this for Krishna. Because that, you're doing it for Krishna. You are doing it for Krishna. Therefore you don't have to have the words in your head, I'm doing it for Krishna. But if sometimes you forget why, and you ever question, why am I doing this? Then you have to answer, I'm doing this for Krishna. You understand? So you shouldn't feel upset if not every minute of the day, I'm doing this for Krishna is in a loop in your head, you know. I'm doing this for Krishna, click. I'm doing this for Krishna, click. I'm doing this for Krishna, click. You shouldn't feel upset if that loop isn't in your head. <laughs> 